Today, we're going to talk about race. And this is coming about because I've seen several things recently uh, in which there's been some talk that there's some racial tension going on, and, and I wanted to weigh in on that. I heard about things of uh, reparations. I was listening to uh, Hotep Jesus and Scott Adams' interview. This is kind of what brought up some of this. Also, I'm uh, listening to a, an audiobook right now by Bo Bennett, who's usually a very rational, logical person, about probably 85, 90% of what it is that he talks about and does. He's actually where I got the uh, idea, and it's out of his book is kind of my outline for all of my Logical Fallacies series. But I've been hearing these things about race, and I thought, why don't I weigh in and, and talk about my experience, and, and why would you care? Well, I'll start out by saying I'm not a racist, and I don't owe anybody anything of any color, any gender, any ethnic background, any religion, anything like that. I haven't harmed folks who I owe anything to. Now, here's one exception to that. I was a cop for almost 10 years. During that time, I gave speeding tickets. I accepted my salary, which was stolen money. So that whole classification of people yeah, I owe them something, perhaps reparations, apology, something like that. But today I'm talking about race. And I do not owe anyone anything based on race. I am not a bad person because I'm white. Now, I'm not proud of being white any more than I'm proud of being six foot two or having graying hair or any other thing that I had nothing to do with. I'm not proud of just accidents of nature. I'm proud of things that I do well. And here's something I did do well. I did live almost 50 years now treating people of all different races and colors really well. So, unless you come up with a, a new, better argument than anything I've heard so far, screw your reparations, screw your affirmative action, and what was the other thing that's the hot thing now? The critical race theory that I'm just naturally bad? Screw that. Nope. That, that's not how this goes. So here's, here's my experience, and I'm going to now justify what I have just said. Here's my experience for the last 50 years with the highlights, the most important or pivotal moments of things in which I was around black people or people who were different than me, a different, a darker skin color, which pretty much everyone is, uh, or times that I experienced racism, that I, I, I saw it happening. I'm going to talk about those. And I, I have a number of bullet points here I'm going to go through, and, and and we'll see what you think at the end. Am I, a, am I a bad racist dude? Do I owe anybody anything? And again, my argument is that I don't. So starting out, uh, the earliest I can remember, we would go up and visit my uncle. We lived in Tennessee at the time. And we'd go visit my uncle. He was from Louisiana. And he referred to black people by the N-word and was an absolute racist. I mean, he he later in life would, he would softened up and he would explain how, yeah, back when he worked in New Orleans and he had a, a guy there uh, who was on his crew doing construction. He says, yeah, he says, if it was getting late, instead of just dropping him off at the, on his uh, cross street, he says, I'd drive him all the way home. I just didn't want the cops to mess with him. So he was saying, hey, I'm a good guy here in doing that. Uh, he also talked about, uh, and this was when I was in my teens, he was telling me about he'd take his date down to the station and they'd watch the cops beat people's knees. Uh, they'd go out and grab some black guy and beat his knees with a stick until he'd admit to something. That's bad stuff. Like, that's really bad. Always made me uncomfortable hearing the N-word. Uh, my mother explained to me, and this is when I was just a, a little kid, because he was a he's a rough, tough Cajun guy, and he'd sit around and curse and yell at the TV and news and football. And uh, uh, so mom would then explain to me, you know, that's, that's not a nice word to call people. And, you know, they're, when he says that, he means black people and black people aren't bad and that's a bad word. So, yeah, that's not cool. Um, but he lives right with your grandmother. I don't want you to lose your whole relationship with your grandmother. So we're still going to go and visit grandmother and uh, try to spend as little time as possible listening to him rant and rave about racist stuff. So that was that was growing up years. Um, when I was about 13 years old, I believe, 
we lived in uh, in Tennessee at the time. We were poor, but my mom saved her money up and bought me for my birthday a series of three introductory classes, uh, karate classes. So we would go to the nearby town of Cookville, Tennessee, uh, to Jack Scott United Karate Studio, and I would take the lesson. And as it turned out, at the end of the third lesson, that was when, as a, a good business person would, they you know gave the sales spiel and you know why don't you join up and do this? We we like Shepherd. And my mom had to explain, oh, no, no, I, we, we could never afford this. We just did this for the, you know, the, the introductory thing. And we love it. He loves it. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. But yeah, we, we can't sign up. It's not something we can afford. Well, they ended up, uh, the guy who owned the karate studio, ended up trading things out. I, I would go over to his house and uh, help pick up sticks and such in the yard and rake leaves. And, and we traded that out for lessons. In truth, now that I'm older, I look back. That was charity. He was hooking us up. He knew we were so dirt poor it wasn't going to happen. So he was hooking us up. So I, I continued these lessons for a while until I think mother also realized, you know, we're taking advantage. We're not paying our fair share for this. And um, yeah, we, we probably ought not to keep doing this. But while we were going to these classes, we were headed in one afternoon and we were out on the freeway just outside of Monterey, Tennessee. I-40 runs through there. And we saw a woman who was broken down in the, in the median in her car. And so mom pulled over to see if we could help. And it was a black gal, which is, I think, why my mother pulled over. Monterey wasn't a, uh, an inclusive town. Lots of racism going on there. And she just didn't feel comfortable. She said, leaving this gal there. So she pulled over and, and hey, what's wrong? And, yeah, car doesn't sound right. And so mom said, well, follow us. We'll, we'll take you to our local mechanic and we'll make sure everything's okay. So mom led her to our mechanic and went in and introduced him and, and was like, you know, this is our friend and made sure that she was taken care of. And when mom was confident about that, well, now it was too late for karate, but we headed on home because the gal was going to be okay. So that was, that was another experience I had. Um, a little bit after that, I think when I was 13, 14, 15 years old, something like that, we went into the, uh, into town, we were going to take a bicycle to be repaired. And we were at the first, we were at the health food store and we came out and there was a, a guy in the parking lot, a black guy. And he saw that we had the car. I don't know if the trunk was up or something like that and asked about it. And, and it turns out he just fixed it for us right there. And I thought that was really cool. Uh, he ended up, he, he went to the local college there in Cookville. He ended up later kind of trying to court my mother. Um, and she would have been 40 at the time, something like, no, oh, no, she would have been older than that, late forties by this time. Uh, but she was still an attractive gal. She'd been a beauty queen in her youth. And, and so she kind of thought, well, this is weird that this early twenties college football player is interested in an old white lady like me. Like, He's a college guy. He has his pick of all the gals in college. If he plays football, why me? But well, maybe he likes me. Well, she kind of figured out later that it was probably a bet or a dare or something to, you know, see who could go out and get the the oldest gal or the whatever. So it didn't work out. But he came out to see us a time or two. And um, he was nice. He was actually the only man that ever taught me when I shook his hand. I wasn't looking at him in the eye. And he corrected me. He says, when you shake a man's hand, look him in the eye. And I still remember that. Thanks, guy, for teaching me that. So that was when I was 13, 14, maybe 15-ish, um, still in Tennessee. Then, uh, let's see. Oh, and then so right around that time also, we were going to Mennonite churches, but also Baptist churches. And we were going to Mineral Springs uh, First Baptist Church. It was near Monterey, Tennessee. And I was really religious at that point. Um, there were a group of youth, and we would get together after church, rather than going up on the hill and playing volleyball, we would stay there in the main sanctuary, and we would have a, a Bible study and sing and study verses out of the Bible and that kind of stuff. And then I remember once after that, we went into town, into Monterey, uh, to go to Dairy Queen to get some ice cream. And uh, as we were driving along uh, the street in Monterey, there were some uh, black guys walking down the street, which was not normal. Uh, this, this was in the 80s, mid-80s. And... That didn't really happen much in Monterey. So 
uh, the guys in the truck that I was in, they slow down, pull over, roll the window down and yell at him. Hey, enters, get out of here. Go back. You don't belong here or whatever. Get out of town, that kind of thing. And then we kept driving and I'm thinking, wow, these are good church going, the most devout of the devout youth. And they're doing that. That's really messed up. That's weird. That's, that sucks. And, uh, that, yeah, that was a impactful moment. I didn't, I didn't like that much at all. I thought that was pretty darn wrong. And then that was, uh, that was probably my last experience in, uh, Tennessee. Then we moved out to the Rocky Mountain West to a little, little ski town and, uh, hardly any black people lived there. There was a guy at the hospital. I, I think he was the anesthesiologist. Um, and he was black. And then there was Bill, uh, who still lives in town. I see him at the grocery store every so often. And Bill worked with my mother in another retail uh, store at that point. And uh, I, that was the only, oh, one other guy who had a moving company in town. Uh, and, and that was it. So there were three black people in our town of 5,000. It's probably now at 10,000 people. Um, now there are a few more black people there, but yeah, still really low black population there. And so I, I kind of got to know him just because he worked with my mother. Uh, we were never close friends or anything, but he was just a really nice cool guy. Um, let's see, after him, uh, then I went to college, uh, to a junior college in a remote little, not the nicest town. Um, and I, I went to this little, little college and there was, there were some international students there and I was part of the international students club. And let's see, I think the first gal I dated there was Sharon. She was a black gal from South Central uh, Los Angeles. And then I also dated uh, Saiko from Japan. And uh, yeah, I, I think I had evenings uh, just like going on one date or something with uh, uh, some white gals, but I didn't really have any serious or, you know, longer than two or three dates relationships with anyone other than the, uh, the, the two gals I just mentioned. Um, so that was junior college. And then I moved to Southern California to pursue my career in law enforcement and, uh, went to a little beach town and my boss there was actually a, a black guy and, uh, he was awesome. We got along well, just we had a good old time together. Uh, his thing, uh, he, in this little beach town, there were not a lot of black people there. Um, but he, and so he just kind of would mess around with the rest of us. Anything we said that, that he didn't like, if we were arguing about whatever, he'd say, that's racial, man, that's racial. And we all just bust out laughing. We couldn't help, help it. Um, he was, yeah, I, Wish I could have worked with him longer. Uh, let's see. After that, that would have been um, right after college. Oh, and by the way, in college, um, my best friends were uh, Ahmed. He was from Saudi Arabia, I think. There was Khalid from Pakistan uh, and then Muhammad from Jordan. And uh, there were a number of other friends, but, you know, from France and other places. But I just, I'd like people that weren't kind of like people I'd always known, uh, nothing against white people, but it, I found other people to be interesting, just hung out with them and I tended to gravitate toward the international club and, and, uh, yeah, people that weren't, weren't looking exactly like me. Okay. So now we're back in, uh, I, I moved back for a little bit. Now we're back in uh, Southern California and I want to be a police officer. So I go to uh, Los Angeles police department, fill out the application and it's a tough process. They have these evenings every once or twice a week or once every two weeks, not sure which it is, that you go and you'd sit in this room with 30, 40, 50 other people and do the application. And, and it, it was a kind of a stressful kind of thing. If you got past that, there, there were stage after stage after stage, but that was the first one. And there I learned that uh, there were lessons on how to go through the process and become a cop. So I, I went to one and it was a, it was an LAPD sergeant that was teaching it. He was a black guy. And he explained to us, to the, especially to the white guys in the classroom, uh, he said, you're going to have to do really well on this. Like take this stuff I'm teaching seriously because of affirmative action. You don't stand much of a chance unless you really score as high as possible. So I listened carefully and I went to the, uh, oral board exam and that's where the big decision is made. You know, the, the, the first application is just kind of 
Uh, do you fog a mirror? Are you decent? Are you uh, do you do you understand English to some level? Uh, are you just a basic decent candidate to be a cop? So that was easy to pass. The oral board that was the one you had to do well on. And so I took it, and I was so excited. I got the results, and I got a hundred percent. And that is very rare. Um, I actually contacted this guy who taught the class to say thank you. And then I learned from him. He says, yeah, he says, that's, that's great. He said, just so you know, they are down to, and now I'm forgetting the number. I think it was down to 102% for white guys. Um, and you get five extra points if you had been in Desert Storm, if you'd been part of the military industrial complex during uh, Desert Storm. Not if you had been in the military before that, but that was one of the more recent things. So that would give you five extra points. So unless you had 102 points, you were not going to get hired. And that was the case with me. And they put me through another thing or two, but it was just dragging on and on. So I, I asked the guy, I said, well, I said, what are the standards for other people? Turns out that, and I'm not sure if I have these correct, but I think if you were a black man and you got 90%, you'd be hired. You'd be put into the next batch of people to be hired. If you were a black female, no. If you were a Hispanic male, you had to get 80%. If you were a female, that I think you could, you didn't have to be a particular race. I think you could just be female, and then you only had to get 70% to be ushered on into the next step. So I didn't happen to be a female or a black man or a Mexican man. And I don't know if it was Mexican only or if it was Hispanic. I don't know what they called it at the time. It, things go in and out so much that who knows what was politically correct at the moment. But I didn't stand a chance. I didn't get in to a job that I earned by preparing for years in in college. I mean, I remember I'm, I had maps up of the city of Los Angeles studying streets. This was such a big goal of mine, um, talking to mentors and what can I do to make this happen? And like, this is a big life dream. And I lived in such a way, you know, I wasn't one of these drinkers or partiers in, in college. And one of the reasons, because, because I don't think people generally like me much and wouldn't invite me to parties, but more importantly, I didn't want to get in trouble. Like I had to keep a perfectly clean record so that I could be a cop. Big deal to me. So I didn't get, didn't get that job. That was my first time really experiencing, um, racism beyond, huh, I don't think that person likes me or, ooh, that person yelled at me. But like, really, truly, here's a life altering, you can't have this job because of the color of your skin kind of racism. So that was my first big experience and happened to be that I was the victim of it. Um, I, I don't know if it would have, it probably wouldn't have been as impactful if I had heard from someone else, oh yeah, they're not letting the black people in. Um, you're, you're in luck, Shepard. You're going to get in, but the black people, they won't get in because they have to get such a high score. It's, it's impossible. That probably wouldn't have been as impactful. It should have, but I don't think it would have been, to be honest. Um, I'll, I'll admit that. Okay, so uh, after this, then I uh, I wind up getting a job for another sheriff's department in Southern California, a big one, and uh, went through the academy. I think one black guy in the academy, turns out he was a, a friend of mine, um, probably I think one or two of my academy classmates, mates, I ended up knowing afterward, like his friends and went to dinner and said so it was Sean. Sean was the guy. I think he ended up in Pasadena or, or somewhere. But, you know, we went out to dinner up there and he came down. We went running in uh, Long Beach where I lived. Uh, I lived in a, a black community, a, a black neighborhood, a black apartment complex. I think there was uh, one other white guy in the apartment complex. But I didn't care. I'm like I was I was in Southern California, my dream location and and trying to get a job as a cop. I was just happy to be alive and I didn't really see it as a pro or a con. It was just. I, I don't care. It was a good price. And that's where I lived. Um, so there I am. And uh, what else did I do? Okay. So I got this job at the, uh, the, the uh, sheriff's department, went through the academy. Black guy was a friend. That was kind of my 
experience there. Um, then I got out of the academy, was in jail, um, had to spend, uh, I think, seven years at that point working in the jail before you could uh, – reasonably get promoted and test out uh, to be onto the streets, uh, to be street patrol, which is what I really wanted and dreamed of, um, and which is what have happened uh, would have happened immediately had I gone to the LAPD. So uh, working in the jail, very few uh, black people in the jail working as deputies. There was uh, one guy there, and he was awesome. I remember once the uh, when I was real new the uh some of the deputies had me step into a cell like oh yeah go check out the make sure there's nothing in the toilet make sure there's no pruno or whatever well there wouldn't have been because this was in the intake uh, area so i walk in and they slam the door shut and now i'm locked up and they i don't know they left me there for half an hour or something like that and then finally decided to let me out and ha 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 funny prank um and this one deputy who was black he was the one who kind of defended me and said, hey, man, that ain't right. Like, they locked you up. You didn't deserve that. That's that's messed up. And Pete chewed him out and, like, kind of came to my defense. And so I think that was yet another thing that gave me a positive impression and made me not dislike people of other colors. Like, here's here's the one guy standing up for me, and and he's black. That's pretty cool. So knew him. We weren't buddies off off duty or anything, but he was he was a good guy. Um, racism in the jail. So I, I was there for just a little under two years, and the greatest population in the jail. I'm not sure if it was Hispanic or white, but in the jail, I think any decent sized jail. It's probably not the case in a 300 person town in in the Midwest, but in a in a bigger city. Any jail is going to be broken up into different segments, not by the uh, not by the guards or the the system, but inside each tank, the black people are going to hang out together, and then the uh, uh, Hispanics are going to be broken into two groups. In in our jail, there were the uh, uh, let's see what are they the Chicanos. Those were the second or more generation in the U.S. And then the Border Brothers were the people who didn't speak English and had just moved up um, from Mexico to Southern California and ended up in jail. Um, so there was black, white, and then uh, Chicano and um, Border Brothers. And then the, the Vietnamese people had a big population in our county. That'll tell you where we were. Uh, the Vietnamese population, not too many people went to jail. So there were usually only two or three, and they just kind of whatever. It wasn't like a prison, uh, a maximum security prison, where it really mattered that you had a decent sized click. Um, the Vietnamese guys, like, they weren't getting beat up or anything, but they were just kind of the the out gr or off group. Um, didn't really hurt them or help them, but they just weren't, didn't have to be a part of anything. So I saw that. And then I also noticed working in the jail, something I learned, it was a very interesting lesson. I was able to watch when I'd have chow hall duty, I would go and stand there and all the inmates would file in. It was usually about two to three hours that chow hall took. And so each tank would come in. I think they had seven or eight minutes to sit and eat and then they needed to go. So there's just this constant line coming in and I would watch let's say play it conservative 1500 men every day that I worked, um, that I had chow hall duty, which was usually, I would watch them come filing past me. I would see how they walked. I would see their posture. I would see how their, what their gait was. I would see all, how they dressed. Now they all wore their jumpsuits, but there was a lot of variation from there. Some people combed their hair, some people's t-shirts, were really high and tight here, no sag in them. Um, some people just look really sloppy. Um, there was the, the jumpsuits. Some of them were nicely pressed. They looked really sharp. Others had wrinkles. And I watched these 1,500, and they rotated over the years I was there. They would be in jail for a while, and then they would get out. When they're out, um, we would call them an inmate out of custody um, because you knew they were going to come back. That was just part of their lifestyle. Who knows why? Maybe it was racism. I think it had more to do with uh, coming from a, a bad neighborhood, a, a neighborhood where people didn't have much money. They didn't have much hope. They didn't have much class. They didn't have they didn't have the opportunities if people chose to stay in that community. Um, they just didn't have much going on in life. And so 
as it turns out, they'd get out of jail and wind up coming back. So I got to watch these people walking, eating, uh, living, and I got pretty good at identifying this class of person. I could be 100 miles away driving along um, and watch somebody walking down the street and go, ah, I'm watching out for this guy. Sure enough, I get closer and it wasn't just his gait. He had the prison tattoos or the jail tattoos. So there's there's not beautiful, vibrant, rich colors in them. They're that dark green color and certain look to them, a certain type. I got so good at identifying that, that, um, yeah, I, th- I think I could go just about anywhere. I remember some years later I went to, uh, France. I was in Paris and, and, uh, oh, what was the city I really liked? Anyway, it was a big city too. And yeah, sure enough, I could just watch people walking down the sidewalk. And I'm like, oh yeah, that guy's been to prison and I don't, I don't know if he's going back, but that guy's been in, been in prison. And you just had this eye of being able to pick out this kind of person, the kind of person who would use meth, who would burglarize a house, who would rob, who would murder, who would do this kind of um, crime, according to the government, in the place where I lived. So that's just something I'm going to bring this up later. That's I'm mentioning this now to say I really became a student of certain class of human behavior. While I was a cop in Southern California, uh, I think it was between both of my two jobs there. I, I started out in the uh, in the jail, and then eh, a little under two years, I couldn't wait another five to get on the street. I was too anxious, so I, I got a job at a, a little beach town in Southern California as a cop there, which was pretty close to my dream job because LAPD. I wanted to end up in Venice Beach, and so this was kind of like just down the beach from there. Uh, this is kind of a dream job. And so uh, I was working there. You get hired, you get six months. If you don't pass uh, the field training process, then you get canned. Um, so you're kind of a recruit, but you're a, a full-fledged police officer, but you just, you don't have a permanent job. You're on probation. So I worked in that town. And uh, while I was there, I, there, I don't think there were any black officers. I think we only had 20 or 30 cops there and none of them were black. Um, we didn't have that many black people in town. It was, uh, mainly white, mainly really wealthy. I, I, on patrol, our job was to keep the scum from the rest of the whole area out of our little town. And so, you know, if Santa Monica would grab a backseat full of homeless people and drive them down at midnight at a hundred miles an hour down PCH and drop them off in our city, then it was our job to make life miserable enough that those people would leave and go some other place and get out of our town so that, so that our poor wealthy white residents didn't have to look at panhandlers or just little yucky, dirty people who, who looked ugh, walking down the street. They didn't want to have to put up with that kind of, ugh. isn't that sad? Anyway, that was part of what we did was getting, getting rid of the, anybody who wasn't good enough to be there. Now it was okay for workers to be there like me. It was okay for the cops to come and provide security for people. It was okay for the grocery store clerks and and the cooks and all these people. It's okay. But they didn't live in that city. Very few. I mean, I don't think any of the cops lived in that city. We all had to travel from elsewhere because it was a nice, nice place and we couldn't afford to on our, on our salaries. So there was a, a main artery that ended up in our city that went to South Central Los Angeles. And I was taught that every so often there'd be a, a car load. It was an older American four-door sedan, and there'd be three or four guys in it, either black or Hispanic, uh, shaved heads, tattoos, a lot of sleeveless t-shirts at this time. This would have been in the mid nineties and they would come rolling into town and find something to rob, uh, find a business to rob or burglarize or something like that. And then they would just hightail it back to, uh, back to their home. And so our job was to kind of keep an eye out make sure those folks weren't in town. If they were, get them to move on before they committed a crime so that they didn't commit one in our city and that they would move on to another area to commit their crime. And I remember in the beginning, not really understanding it. I I didn't know that much about different races and such. Um, My time in the jail taught me some, uh, the difference between the Chicanos and the Border Brothers, but I guess I didn't really internalize it. And uh, the field training officers would get on me, why aren't you pulling over more people? And I'm like, well, you know, I don't see anything really going wrong. 
And they'd be like, well, you got to be proactive. And so I, they'd say, oh, pull that car over. Look at that guy. See if he has warrants. And sure enough, they had that eye way better than I did. And I'd pull the car over, run the person for a warrant. Sure enough, they'd have a warrant. And I'd be like, how did this cop know this? Like, they didn't know that particular person, but they just knew from the eye movement or the way the person avoided them or whatever, they had a pretty strong gut instinct as to who this person was, somebody we wanted. And so I saw some of this and they're like, okay, this is how you do it. And then I remember pulling over a vehicle and uh, writing a ticket for a taillight being out. And that's what we were told is, you know, you find anything, the license plate light is out, the tail light is out, the, the tire tread is too thin. There's a state statute about that. You pull the person over for that. And if you can't see anything that's really wrong, I remember once being told by the time you get up to the window, kid, you'll think of something. You'll think of why you pulled them over um, that you can put into the report if anything should develop from it. Well, I remember pulling the one car over with a break, broken tail light, give a uh, ticket for it, and then afterward, the field training officer is kind of chewing me out. And he's like, this poor person is up here from Mexico. Yeah, they're illegal, but they're washing dishes. They're working their butt off trying to support their family. And now you gave them a ticket for 50 bucks or whatever. And now they're going to they're gonna go and they're going to get the, the uh, taillight fixed. But now they've got an extra $50 bill. That's a big deal to them. And if they don't pay it, which there's a chance that they don't really understand how to go about it then they're going to end up having a warrant put out for their arrest. And then we're going to arrest them. Then they're going to lose their job because they're in jail for a day or two or three or whatever. And, and like, don't do that. These people are just good, hardworking people trying to make it in life. And I'm like, Oh God, I got the wrong Mexican. I was supposed to pull over the Mexican with tattoos with a shaved head. And I, and I didn't really understand it that well. And as matter of fact, when I got fired, it was, uh, it was for being a, a, a Midwestern Mennonite, uh, mentality. I think that's, those were the words the chief used. Um, I just wasn't street savvy enough. Um, so let's see, those were experiences in town. I remember there was a, the, a guy who was just a jerk, uh, Joe, and there was a no Joe zone that he couldn't be in down in the area where the boardwalk was the strand, um, out on the pier and the local judge had, had did a restraining order saying you cannot be in these areas. And so we called it the no Joe zone. And Joe was in that area once. And uh, we chased him, caught him, took him to jail for the night. And as we were arresting him, one of the cops, and this was, I think, the only racist thing I saw in that town. And when I say racist, I mean, not taking other things into consideration, just making a decision about somebody based on the color of their skin. The, I mean, you know what, now that I'm thinking about it, this wasn't a racist thing. The guy was a different color, but what happened wasn't because of his color. It was because he was always a jerk. He was such a jerk to tourists. He was such a joke to uh, jerk to locals, to cops, to the judge, that he had this restraining order put against him. So I, I take that back. This, this wasn't a racially motivated thing. But as we were arresting him, we were grabbing his bicycle to put it in the in the back of our car to take it in. And well, before we did, he's like, get my bike, man. And, and he's like cursing at us and telling us to. And uh, before we grab it, a uh, field training officer uh, says, I don't see a bike. And the people up on the balcony, the and this was half a block off of the, the beach, so they're rich white folk. Uh, they looked down, they said, yeah, we don't see a bike either. Okay, now they might've been racist or maybe they saw that he was being a jerk. And so it was more of retaliating against a jerk and supporting their law enforcement. But whatever the case was, that was, that could be argued to be racist or jerkist. <laughs> I don't know which. Um, but Joe went to, Joe went to jail for that night. Um, what else happened there? Oh, and well, so while I am doing that, I'm not sure if it was when I was in the beach town or at the county jail, uh, but I volunteered. My aunt was uh, part of a group of people who follow the, uh, a black talk show host, and he organized this thing where uh, his his listeners, his volunteers would go and teach tennis to kids in Compton. So I, I remember doing that once, I think, maybe twice, but I think once, twice. Uh, we would go into Compton and uh, teach them to play 
tennis. And I remember there's some really cool characters that I met there, like local community leaders. Um, they didn't have official titles. They didn't work for the government, but they were, they were really into activism and such and cool guy. What was his name? Hayes or something like that. If I think of it, I'll put him in the, uh, in the description, just cause he was such a neat guy. He, uh, had a cricket team he formed in Compton and it was all black guys. And so it's like, poor black guys playing cricket. So they, I guess they traveled the world and uh, had a lot of fun because he did this and he just wanted to help the guys experience new things and show, Hey, we're, we're able to do this too. So I thought that was really, really cool of him. Cool guy. Um, what else? Oh, so I recall one time in, uh, Let's see here. Yeah. One time in this beach town where I'm working as a cop, uh, my field training officer, we see the car. It's the, you know, the, the low riding Impala four deep skin heads, uh, dark skin color, jail tattoos, just the hunched shoulders that were so easy to pick out. Just see this person. You're like, okay, they've been in jail recently. And so he says, pull up beside him. So I pulled up to their left and he got his PR 24, which is like the baton that has the handle on it. And he held it like it was a gun. He aimed it at him and he was like, you know, did this a couple times. And then he told me fall back. So I went back and we followed them. And sure enough, they went and hit that main artery and headed out of our beach town back toward the inner city. And that was that racist. What do you think? Was it carist because it was a four door older sedan? Was it a harist thing because they all had really short hair? Was it a tattooist thing? Was it a, a body language thing? Was it a class thing? I don't know. But based on my experience, and I'm, I'm anti-government, anti-law enforcement at this point. I think cops are too brutal with Everybody, not all cops, not all the time, but there's way more violence than there needs to be and that cops are initiating. I'm, I'm opposed to that. I'm not defending police officers working in the job as police officer. I, when I was doing it, I'm, I'm earning, the money I'm earning is being stolen from people. They're calling it taxes, but it's stolen money. Like it's completely a wrong profession for any to be, anybody to be in. I'm against it. Having said that, when people say most cops are racist or a lot of cops are racist, what I saw in a big agency and then a small agency in Southern California in a time, like I think many times, that race was an issue. It was a thing that was talked about. I think that most of what I saw, there could have been some cops that were racist that just didn't mention it to me. Maybe that was their motivation. But most of what I saw, like this example with a car, it was like, that was a bad guy. we got to get the bad guys out of here. We're going to be the big, bad intimidators, and we're going to let them know, get out of our town. And I don't think it was a racist thing. Uh, there were elements of it, but I wouldn't say it was primarily a racist thing to do. So that was in that town. Um, what else in that town? Anything else? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So then after that, I, uh, moved, I didn't pass, as I mentioned, I didn't pass the field training. I was fired. Um, so I applied to a bunch of agencies. I wound up back in a little Rocky mountain town, uh, where everybody knew me and, uh, moved back there. Very few black people. So I didn't really have an experience, uh, after that in my, in my police career that I can say that I, I saw that black people were or weren't picked on, but they're just, like I say, we knew the few black people who lived in town and they were all good guys. One of them would get arrested every so often, but he was also cool. And we'd let him go a lot on stuff that there were crimes that we could have gotten him for that they were written in the book, but he was a cool guy. So I just let him go. So I don't think there was racism there that I saw at all. Um, let's see. So after that, then I got out of law enforcement and we started owning a number of different businesses. Um, I remember for a, a little while we owned a couple uh, UPS stores and it was hilarious because I think that, that people who are racist are kind of jerks and I don't like them. Uh, people are welcome to have their opinion. And if you don't like white people or black people or brown people or whatever, like I don't have a problem with that. I, I think it's silly and goofy of you and I, but as long as you're not hurting anybody, then you're welcome to think whatever you think. Um, but we we had at the time, we had an Indian from India, and uh, we had a an, an, another Indian who was a Native American. 
And so we had this one drunk guy who was yelling that he was a former vet, but he came in and had some issue with his package and he started yelling about us hiring all these damn Mexicans. <laughs> And there wasn't a single Mexican there. There was uh, uh, two kinds of Indians and a, uh, uh, who's the other? Let's see, there's Joel, Chris. So two kinds of Indians. Who was the other guys? Ah, I'm blanking on it now. Uh, but yeah, there, there, there weren't any uh, Hispanic guys, Mexican guys working there, but he, he blamed them for that. And I thought that was kind of funny. Yeah, I think one of them might have been white, just darker skinned. I don't remember. Um, okay, so that, that was a little anecdotal thing. So yeah, there, there is a racist, at least, in, uh, in that little town. Um, what else? Oh, and, and then later I started uh, or bought another business and, and then still nothing racist, never saw anything or, you know, didn't really come across anything that could be considered racial in nature. Um, and then I started another business and in that business, a, uh, a guy who I was kind of friendly with, um, hired him to come on and be a coach. And he was a black guy and, uh, the fourth, the fourth black guy that moved to our area. Um, and so he's been around for a while and we're still friends. And, uh, I actually remember, oh yeah, here's a racist thing. I went to a, a, a get together thingy, uh, a shooting competition. And one of the guys was talking about Obama at the time, and they were using the N word, uh, about that enter in, in the white house. And I was just shocked because it had been a long time since I'd heard that word. And I'm like, Whoa. And then I started thinking my buddy, Michael, who worked with me as well. I'm like, Oh my gosh. So I get a hold of Michael and I'm like, Dude, and by this time he'd moved back to DC for a while. And uh, I'm like, man, I wish you were still in town. You'd have to go to this. I'd almost want to take you to this match just for fun. Cause here's what the guy was doing. He's like, oh yeah. He says, if I get back and you're still going, like, we got to do this uh, just to see if they would like shut up and like him and see that he shot well. And then we'd all get along. Maybe he could teach them that, hey, I'm just some other dude. Um, but yeah, that was kind of one experience. Um, yeah. Other than that, I'm thinking that that has been, yeah, that's everything that I, I jotted down that I can think of. I'm sure I've missed some things. Um, but that was my experience. Now in that time, was there anything that I did that I owe a person because of race, not because I was a statist, not because I was a tyrant, but because of race, was there anything that I did to anyone that I owe them anything? And if so, how much? If you can think of any of these stories that I've told you, is there at some point, because I was a passenger in the truck in Monterey, Tennessee, when the church boys yelled at the, the black guys, uh, you know, get the heck out of town, because I was a passenger there and didn't grab the steering wheel and drive, pull the truck into a, a light pole to kill all of us, do I owe each of those guys five bucks, hundred bucks, million bucks each? How much do I owe them? This is, this is bringing up the, the real point here. I see color. Like I can identify you, you, you put me in a room with three black guys and three white guys. I can pick the white ones out. I can pick the black ones out. I see color. Of course I see color. I don't treat people differently because of it. Uh, maybe I do tend to have a bias that I, I like black people a little bit more. Um, like I'll give them a little bit more of a, a chance or I'm more interested in them because I'm like, oh, I've been around 99% of the people I've been around in my life have been white. Oh, here's a chance to be around somebody who's French, um, white as can be, but they're from a, they're from France. Th they're going to be more interesting. Like I can step outside of my normal box and chat with people or, oh, here's somebody who's a different color than I'm used to. Hey, maybe I can learn something from them or hang out with them. And uh, so there's, there's that interest. But there's nothing that I have done to harm anyone that I would owe anybody reparations. There's nothing I've done that makes me inherently evil. And it's complete BS if you say that I was born because I was born a certain gender or a certain uh, color or a certain race or whatever. That just I was born that way and that makes me bad. And that I don't see it, but really just the way I go about life Maybe I'm not seeing enough black people to smile at because subconsciously I am frightened of black people. Whatever critical race theory says, it is complete BS. And I have not studied it extensively. Um, probably spent half an hour 
looking into it at a couple different times. Uh, so a grand total of half an hour. I don't know that much about it. Maybe I'm missing something. This, this systemic racism. I, I don't know. Maybe it exists somewhere, but it doesn't exist around me or that I'm aware of. Um, and, and it's not like I know, I'm, I, I have this group that I know lives over in this neighborhood near me and they're all a bunch of racists and they're going out and, and uh, telling all the business owners, Hey, you better not hire any black people. Well, no, like if I knew that, that's something I would bring up and say, that is a system of racism. Like that is an, that is a thing that's ongoing and those guys are bad. Now it wouldn't mean that I owe anybody anything, but those guys, yeah, they're being jerks and hopefully they, they're not treated well by the rest of us. Hopefully the rest of us say, no, you're not doing business at my place. You're one of those jerks that, that is messing with people just, just because they're a certain color. Like that's messed up. No, we're not going to give you, we're not going to serve you at our business. So that, that example that hasn't happened that I know of, that would be system, systemic racism. But never have I been in any business where I have seen a person who wanted a job who was qualified not get it because of the color of their skin or because of their gender. Like, I have never seen that happen. I'm sure it happens, but I haven't seen it happen. And so since it's not in my arena, I am not going to accept responsibility for what the KKK did 70 years ago, whenever the uh, well, I don't think the Democrats started. It was a group of Democrats who started it, but it wasn't a, I don't think it was a bipartisan organization. I think it was a, it was a way to kind of bring racist people of, of multiple parties together. But those guys, 50, 100, whatever years ago, those guys are bad guys, in, in my opinion, uh, just like a, a guy who flips off a little old lady who's moving too slowly. Yeah, bad guy. Um, I'm not saying I should initiate violence against them. There shouldn't be a penalty for that, like not a, uh, an initiation of violence penalty. Uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't care for them so much. Uh, but that's not me. And there are people who have done bad things to people of particular colors. And some of them have done them for reasons of, I don't like you because you're this color. That's bad. That's not good but it ain't me and don't try to pin it on me. Just as you can't say, oh, you white people used to steal a bunch of stuff, therefore you owe reparations. I'm not, I, like don't put me in a category like that and then have me take responsibility for what other people have done. I'm an individual. I am an individual. What was it Martin Luther King said? What did he say, Junior? Something like, I, I dream of a time when people judge you by the person you are and, and not for the color of your skin, something like that. And I know that that's probably now, and my quote wasn't very to the, uh, to the word, but maybe that is now considered racist to say because you should judge the white guy and not give him a job because we're trying to fix something that was perhaps a problem in the past. That was messed up, I mean, not getting that job. You want to talk about affirmative action? I was a victim of it. I did everything right. And I was the victim of it. Now, of course, I look back years later and I'm like, yeah, shouldn't have been a cop anyway and blah, blah, blah. But that's, that's not the point. The point was the system picked somebody, an individual, and said, you do not get to work here because of your, you're part of this other group of people who have a similar characteristic, not the five-toed people, not the red-headed people, not the six-foot-two people, but the skin color people. Because you're part of that group, despite being completely qualified in every way, you don't get the job. That is blatant racism. Now, the argument is, well, yeah, but for many years, it was the other way around and black people couldn't get these jobs that they wanted. And so therefore now the, the white people that want these jobs, they can't get them and we're going to give them to the black people who aren't scoring as well or doing as well to get the job. It, that's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. Shame on the people who did something bad a, a while back. It, maybe you fire them now. If those people are still there and you say, hey, you old 34-year veteran of the LAPD who used to be on the hiring board and, and would never let black people get hired, that's messed up. Um, you're fired and you don't get a pension. Great. But that makes sense. But not to blame a whole classification of people, not to then let this guy not have a job. That's messed up. 
So we talked about critical race theory, talked about affirmative action, um, and then uh, the reparations. That is just, just silly. And, and here's part of what I was hearing in some of these recent podcasts. We need to blah, 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 blah. Who's this we? What you're talking about is the government. The government needs to take money from people based on the color of their skin and give that money after taking a good share for themselves for administrative purposes, of course, you know, they've got to take care of themselves, give a portion of that leftover money after they get their cut, give that money to people of another color, just based on the color of their skin, not qualifications, not nothing else. All we're doing is we're saying people of that color, we're taking money from you. We're giving it to people of that color or saying you who moved to the United States three years ago and became a uh, working person who has money extorted from them, they call it taxes. You who have never done anything to a black person, you who have a darker skin color from India than you consider a really dark Indian person, that dark Indian person is going to be having their money taken from them, part of what they earn, and that money is going to be given to a light-skinned person who is appropriately black, uh, of African descent. Is that ridiculous? Like, that's happening today. There are people today, like, this is, I'm not saying this is superstitious people from 200 years ago. Today, people actually think that's a good idea. If you do, and... If you are a logical thinker, you believe in reason, scientific method. And when I say a logical thinker, I don't mean a good thinker. I mean using the rules of logic. Like if you don't know, if you can't name a few logical fallacies or at least give examples of them, you don't know logic. Go study it. Um, learn how to argue. Learn moral philosophy. Learn sociology. Um, and then, my gosh, I would love to chat with you and, and learn where I'm wrong. Because if I'm wrong... What's my buddy say? I want to know as many true things as possible, and I want to disbelieve as many untrue things as possible. So if if what I'm saying is untrue, if it's irrational, if, if it isn't, isn't correct, I want to be corrected. Please let me know and correct me. Otherwise, don't think I'm going to go along cheerfully paying your extortion for, for reparations. Don't think I'm going to say it's okay for affirmative action to hire people based on the color of their skin, exactly opposite of what Martin Luther King Jr. wanted. Don't think I'm going to go for this nonsense. 